Good morning, everybody. It's nine o'clock, and nine o'clock is with me, Father Warner. We are at the end of the sixth week of Easter. Today is Saturday. Uh, tomorrow we celebrate the Ascension of our Lord. Um, the text of today is taken from Acts chapter eighteen, verses twenty-three to twenty-eight, and I've uh, entitled today's teaching. If you look at the uh, text. Um, the title above verse 24 says the ministry of Apollos. So I've entitled today's teaching meet Apollos The man not the spacecraft of course the spacecraft was called Apollo But uh, let's look at the text first and then let's meet Apollos after spending some time there he dis departed and went from place to place through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now there came to Ephesus a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria. He was an eloquent man, well versed in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and he spoke with burning enthusiasm and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus. Though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. And when he wished to cross over to Achaia, the believers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. On his arrival, he greatly helped those who through grace had become believers for he was powerfully refuted for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public showing by the scriptures that the Messiah is Jesus the word of the Lord now uh, once again as I have asked you before um, in order to fully grasp what is going on between verses 23 and 28, I suggest that you begin reading this entire text from verse 18, which uh, talks about Paul's return to Antioch. So Paul from Corinth heads via Syria to Antioch. So Paul leaves Corinth and he travels towards Antioch in Syria. Now, he takes with him his newfound companions and those are Aquila and Priscilla who had uh, escaped from uh, the persecutions uh, that they were facing in Rome under the Emperor Claudius um, and Aquila and Priscilla literally pitched their tent uh, with Paul and joined in working with Paul in the mission field in Corinth now Cor uh, Paul brings them with him now where are we we are in, in Ephesus. Ephesus is in modern-day Turkey. And it is in Ephesus that Paul makes first a brief stop. He makes a stop because he wants to leave Aquila and Priscilla there to minister, to take care of the believers. Uh, he leaves Aquila and Priscilla to minister because this was also the place he was well received and even though the members of the synagogue ask him to stay Paul moves on he goes to Jerusalem but he goes to Jerusalem via Caesarea and then from Jerusalem if you read verse 18 onwards you will read that uh, Paul goes from Jerusalem via Caesarea and then he goes to Antioch and this is the Antioch which is in Syria and it is in this place Remember that they were first called Christians. Now, we are in verse 23. Our text of today for the liturgy of the Eucharist begins with verse 23. And verse 23 signals the beginning of Paul's third missionary journey. Remember, the first missionary journey took him through Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. The second missionary journey took him to Macedonia. And now we begin the third missionary journey. This missionary journey is more a, a journey of what I would call review and renewal. Review and renewal of the churches he had established on his first missionary journey. For Paul 
as we are told, comes to strengthen the disciples in these churches. It is also a journey where he makes a very, very long stop of three years in Ephesus. We know this when you read uh, later on in Acts chapter 20, verse 31. This is the longest that Paul will ever stay in any place. Remember, in Corinth, he stayed for a year and six months. We saw that uh, in chapter 18, verse 11. He stayed a year and six months in Corinth. In Ephesus, he will end up staying for three years. Now, for some reason, St. Luke, who is the author of not only the Gospel of Luke, but also the author of the Acts of the Apostles, St. Luke chooses to give us um, a little glimpse of what I would call a snippet into the church of Ephesus, even before Paul sets foot there. Perhaps St. Paul wants, uh, say, uh, St. Luke uh, wants to lay the background for us to the church in Ephesus. Now, we know that Paul left Aquila and Priscilla to minister in Ephesus. We are now told that in the very synagogue, a Jew by the name of Apollos arrives from Alexandria. And that's why I said today's teaching is meet Apollos. So, in order to get a clearer understanding into the mind and the ministry of Apollos, we need to look at or rather from where he came. He comes from Alexandria. Where is Alexandria? It was situated on the bank of the river Nile in Egypt. And uh, Alexandria was in the New Testament a flourishing city. The New Testament time you see it was a flourishing city with one third of its population being Jews. Now the city was culturally sought after for it had among many a very famous library uh, you've heard of the uh, University of Alexandria. It had, <coughs> in those days, a very famous lighthouse and even a museum. Now, this is the city that gave us the translation of the Bible from Hebrew to Greek, what is called the Septuagint. The translation of the Bible from Hebrew to Greek came from the city of Alexandria. And much is said in these few verses also now about our friend Apollos. So, Apollos, he is a Jew. He had been instructed in the ways of the Lord. We know from the text he is an eloquent speaker because we are told he speaks with burning enthusiasm in the synagogue. He is a teacher, for we are told that he, as scripture will say, he was well versed in the scriptures. You can see that in today's text. Um, Look at um, verse 24, he is well versed in the scriptures. And hence, he is, as we are also told today, he is able to teach accurately. But, but, we are told that he speaks matters concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. And that's where um, uh, we have to now look at this. So what does this mean? What is the baptism? He knew about Jesus, but only the baptism of John. You see, during Jesus' lifetime, a number of John's disciples traveled into what is called the Jewish diaspora. And here, they preached the message of John the Baptist, which included the coming of the Messiah in the person of Jesus. However, Apollos has an incomplete idea of the mission and the purpose of Jesus, and hence, when he speaks in the synagogue, Aquila and Priscilla have to take him aside and explain to him that his teaching is incomplete. So they have to explain, as we are told in scripture, explain the way of God to him more accurately. Verse 26. So what is it that was incomplete for Apollos? John the Baptist preached, if you remember, a baptism for the repentance of sin. Jesus' baptism was an invitation to salvation. While we may get lost in this, uh, it's a bit theological, this theological insight, let us not get lost in what ought to be picked up by sight. Namely, the way Aquila and Priscilla went about correcting Apollos, the method of fraternal correction. Now, read carefully the words of scripture which I deliberately 
did not highlight earlier, namely how when Aquila and Priscilla realized that this Apollos, this very eloquent speaker, had incomplete knowledge of the faith. See how nicely they look at scripture. They say they took him aside and explained. And you know, when I read this line, it warms the cockles of my heart. You see, uh, and this is a pastoral point I want to make to you. Fraternal correction is very beautiful when done with a pure heart and not out of jealousy. I want to say that again. Very often we feel the need to correct somebody else in our church because of something they are doing wrong. If I do that because I love you, you know, I say, you're a great lector. But hey, I want to point out something that you're you're doing that is wrong or you're saying that is wrong. I want to correct you fraternally. If I do that without jealousy, but supposing I see, oh, you're a great lector in the church and I'm jealous of how well you read because now everybody else wants you to read on Good Friday and Monday, Thursday. So I, I tear you down, I pull you down or I, I, I wait for a chance for you to make a mistake and then I point it out in front of everybody else. That's not what God wants from us. Fraternal correction is beautiful when done with a pure heart and not out of jealousy. We know that Apollos, and we read this in the text, and you'll see this in verse 27, when he wished to go to Achaia, we know that he is encouraged by the community. Please read that. The believers encouraged him, not only they encouraged him, they wrote to the disciples, can you also welcome him? How beautiful would that be if we constantly did this? in our churches. I, I, I acknowledge this is not the reality. We would like it to be the reality. I acknowledge as a priest that this is not the reality. We know that Apollos continues to be successful and we know that this because uh, he's successful in his work in Corinth because his work in Corinth is well documented. If you go to uh, 1 Corinthians in Paul's letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 12, Go to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3 verse 4. Go to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 3 verse uh, 22. Uh, read 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 6. You will see the work of Apollos. Look a little encouragement and see the fruit. And even a slight thumbnail size of discouragement and we destroy the church because we are jealous because we are jealous. Now, I know very often you might say, Father, you talk so much about, um, you know, uh, politics in the church. In fact, this morning I was, uh, I wake up very early in the morning and uh, by 4.30 I'm out on a walk and uh, I generally talk to some people or the other, or in other parts of the world, in other countries while I'm walking. And we were talking this morning about uh, politics. And I said, tell me one part of the world where politics and when we mean politics, we mean how people kind of pull one person down and, you know, we conspire, etc. It exists everywhere. And we should be willing to accept that in an institution like the church where we live the values of Christ, even there Satan pulls us down by filling our hearts with jealousy. Many years ago, and I want to share this with you, uh, when I was a very young man in St. Andrew's, church and I began reading, I remember a priest, uh, you know, being very, um, how, how, how do I put it gently, he was, he was so rude that once uh, while reading he came right between when I was reading as a young man, uh, I was in, in eighth or ninth standard and he actually stopped me and he said, I'm sorry I was not singing, I was a cantor and he said you've taken it too high the hymn and he, he started the hymn. And this was at a funeral and I was horribly embarrassed. But immediately after that got over, there was an elderly lady and her name was Maureen Fernandez. She's passed away, God bless her, and I hope the Lord rewards her just for this one incident. And uh, we all called her Auntie Maureen. Those of you who are watching this in St. Andrews, my generation, uh, she was an institution. And I think I've spoken about her before, but Auntie Maureen caught me and she said, son, she said, don't bother about what he said. Yeah? And she said, you do things beautifully. I want to encourage you. And she was in charge of the lectors. And she stunned me because she said to me, will you do the first reading on Good Friday? 
And now this was on St. Andrew's grounds, uh, he used to have as a young man. And I said, you know, I, I'm not too sure. I, I was a very shy young man. I was extremely shy as a young man. And she would sit me down and she would actually go through the reading with me several times till I was ready to do the first reading on Good Friday. I cannot imagine if I went by the criticism of that priest, which was so badly done in public, versus the kindness of Auntie Maureen. Now, if you are listening to this reflection today, I want to ask you to do something very practical. Take a moment to call a friend who you know has been serving the church, who is in ministry, uh, who cares you know, for the church in one way or the other, who serves the church. And I want to ask you, can you encourage them? Can you thank them? Can you appreciate them? You've got your SEC coordinators. We take them, their work for granted. You know, we slave them. <laughs> Very often they come to our house and we say, oh, don't come now. You know, my husband's not there. Like as if they've got no other work to do. Yeah. And then we just send them away. They have to call us and say there's a meeting. Ah, we are not, you know, we are not in town. You're in town, but you're not in town. Uh, and I've experienced this firsthand with my own uh, SCC animators who have to call up people and say, Father's coming, and are you at home, and can you uh, change the time, and all these kind of things. Appreciate these people. They work very hard. Yeah? Somebody who comes every day and sings in church, somebody who plays the keyboard, somebody who helps in the sacristy, somebody who uh, is a Eucharistic minister, somebody who brings Holy Communion to your home or to your neighborhood for the sick, somebody who is in the charismatic renewal, Encourage them. You know, if your heart is filled with jealousy for someone whose ministry is successful, then also I want to ask you to do something else. Take a moment. Bow your head. Ask the Lord to forgive you. Ask Him to forgive you. Ask Him to forgive, to fill your life with joy. Yeah? Ask the Lord. Say, Lord, I have always been jealous of everybody else. And in my jealousy, I have destroyed your church, Lord. I have destroyed your church by bringing down people, by gossiping about them, by uh, destroying them. And I want to say this sincerely to those people, if you are watching, because I think I'm a straightforward and straight-talking priest. I'm sure those people must be saying, we don't want to listen to this man. There's too much of reality to listen to him from. But if you're listening, Beg the Lord to change your heart because, and I beg you, even if you're a religious or a priest, build people up. Yeah, build them up. Give them a chance. Help them, encourage them. Especially our young people in church. Don't go after them even if they make a mistake. Don't go after them. I always say adults make mistakes behind closed doors. Young people make mistakes in public. Yeah, that's the difference between the two. And the young people get caught, adults are, are clever enough to hide their sins. Okay? Be kind to our people who serve the church. Today uh, is a great day because I, I've got, I get a chance to thank somebody publicly. Somebody who served the church in St. Jude for many, many years. And most of you who used to watch my mass online during uh, the COVID time will remember that our altars at St. Jude's were always beautifully decorated with the most exquisite flowers. For years, Jovita Mendonca uh, always, always uh, decorated the, the altar. And you know, the beautiful thing about Jovita um, was that she taught several other ladies in the parish. So that when she moved to Orlem, uh, where she lives right now, uh, with her husband, uh, she taught others and they are able to continue to do these flower arrangements. That is the mark of an excellent servant in the church. Yeah, not one who keeps all the information and all the knowledge and the technology and the know-how with themselves, but one who shares it with others. So Javita, I know you celebrate your birthday today. You are a woman of faith and you are a daughter of Mama Mary. I know how much you love Our Lady and I there is a testimony of Jovita's on YouTube, a link to St. Jude's Parish. Uh, maybe I might just put it up again on my, uh, I think it's on my Facebook, uh, on my uh, YouTube channel. 
where Chuvita testified to the miracle that took place in her life at Lourdes for, on behalf of her daughter. Uh, and she's had two daughters, and um, uh, Janice and Wendy, and I pray also for both of them. But I thank God for Jovita. And she also, Jovita, I remember with great love um, the years that you worked in my office. I kept teasing you, old, old, old lady, old lady. But you are the most beautiful soul I know. Uh, wonderful, kind, joyful. And I pray that God will bless you and Willie uh, in the years to come. Keep you all together for many, many years. Enjoy your retirement. Happy birthday, Chavita. Happy birthday, my old lady. And God bless you. To all of you uh, watching this, uh, don't forget to like this video. Share it with somebody who needs encouragement, who's serving the church. And uh, for those of you who are watching for the first time, do subscribe to this channel. Have a blessed day. I'll see you again on Monday. Remember Sunday as I take a break. I'll see you again on Monday at 9 o'clock. Remember 9 o'clock is with Father Warner. Bye everybody.